Welcome back, fellow audio enthusiasts. It is I, Jason, your host of Two Channel Listening. Yes. I want today's video to just be a conversation with me and you, the audience. Each of us along our audio journey, we basically, we can share some similarities and yet along the way, we come across some special components and there are times where we stumble upon, we stumble upon synergies that rise above the rest of the gear that we own. Now for me, last year when I purchased the Harbeth Compact 7s, these actually marked the 50th speaker that I have personally purchased and owned since I got serious about, uh, since I really got serious into, into hi-fi 12 years ago. Now you can do the math. I'm coming up on seven months of ownership with these. Um, you know, so as far as shelf life, that's, that's pretty good. That's a long time for me. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. But nevertheless, I do get asked quite often, well, what about the speakers that you regret selling? Which speakers do you wish that you could keep or that you never got rid of? You know, for me, that's an easy question, but boy, is it tough for me to answer for you all. I can narrow it to five speakers and I originally was going to make this video about five speakers, but I'm really just going to, I'm just going to give an honorable mention to two and spend the time really talking about the main two, the middle one I've already done a video on. So let's get to this. Okay. Honorable mentions. And it's just from a vintage coolness factor. You know, if I had endless amounts of money, and more importantly, if I had endless amounts of space and storage, it would have been nice to have kept the Acoustic Research LS or the AR9 LSs. Those were the second revision, the generation two, there was three generations of the AR9s. I had the second revision and those were five-way speakers, five-way design, big old 118 pound speakers, require tons of power um, the SFS 80 Sonic Frontiers tube amp that I had at 80 watts per channel was not enough for those speakers. They needed a lot of a lot of current because they were so prodigious. How much bass that they could put out, and they were an amazing party speaker for what they were back in the 1980s. Very warm and a very open sounding speaker, just a really cool speaker. And I think an underrated vintage speaker that if you newbies have the space and the money, I think it's a good starter speaker. The next speaker on my list that I think was mostly I miss it for the conversation starters that they were those JBL 250 Ti's. What a just when I think of an 80 speaker in a timeless, iconic design, those trapezoidal speakers, that teak finish, humongous 150 pound behemoths. Every time somebody walked into my living room and saw those JBLs, guarantee it was going to have a nice long conversation about audio, about music, and having them sit down to listen to those speakers at very loud levels because. Those JBLs were capable of huge output, very clean, not a lot of other things. I'm not going to get into, you know, um, you know, the exact design and trying to review a speaker that I had seven years ago, something like that. But they deserve an honorable, honorable mention because I wish I still had them for the conversation starters that they were. They were just, they were like a piece of art. I wish I always had them for that. But no. I'm specifically going to talk about three speakers. One I'm going to talk about briefly because I did a very expen I did a very extensive video on, as well as a demonstration video. So for me to actually start off with the BMR, the Philharmonic BMR by Dennis Murphy, I did two videos on those speakers, and let me quickly just say it like this. 
I remember when Eric Alexander came on the scene and the Tecton Pendragons hit the market, audiophiles all over the place were just, they were weak need around those speakers, declaring them giant killers, that they could compete with $20,000 Wilsons and all these others. And, you know, there, there was just a lot of hype with those speakers. Now, yes, at $3,000 for what they were, they did a lot of neat things. However, I feel as strongly about the Philharmonic BMRs as a lot of the reviewers felt about the, ten, the, the Pendragons. What Dennis Murphy did, and remember, Dennis Murphy also designed some of Jim Salk's speakers. Dennis Murphy took the amazing SB Acoustic 6-inch ceramic driver, the very unique namesake, the Balanced Modial Radial Driver as the mid-range. Those things are good for 2K to 20K. And then, you know, I'm biased towards ribbon tweeters. I love what ribbon tweeters do. I love how they float images out there. But nevertheless, you add Dennis Murphy's secret sauce, which is his networks. That's what he's known for designing crossovers. You take those three awesome drivers together, stir it around, and you've got that BMR stand mount speaker. And what it could do, what it represents for $1,900, I'm going to piss a lot of Bowers and Wilkins owners off. If more people would listen to that Philharmonic BMR, I guarantee you there'd be a whole lot less 706s being sold today. That BMR is heads and shoulders above most stand mount speakers out there, many at over $3,000. My regret is that I don't own those speakers to pit against even these Harbeths because I know for a fact that from a bass output standpoint, from a tone out, output standpoint, the BMRs would play lower than, than the Harbeths here. But I can't get into the mid-range because it was a different room, different gear, different time. I regret having those speakers because I can't put them up against everything else that I have. If there's one speaker that should have remained my baseline, it would be the Philharmonic BMRs. I think they're that special. Okay, you can go back and, and listen to them. I did a demonstration of them. They're the kind of speaker that you could put mono blocks to, and then you can flip around and put a 12 watt Class A EL 84 tube amp like I did, and man, what a sweet sounding speaker at 87 dB. Just, oh, yes, wonderful. Nevertheless, I want to spend the most of my time talking about two speakers that I owned long before I even thought of being a YouTuber and, and actually doing reviews for you all. I'm going to sound like a kook. This is a full straight warning. I am very passionate about these next two speakers, and I may came off, may came off, I may come off as kind of weird about them, but it's only because I think the number two on my list is probably one of the most misunderstood brands out there. You either love them and you've owned them and you understand them, or most people just they absolutely don't get it. They'll never spend the money to own a pair. And they easily dismiss them because of some, you know, um, specifications that they read on some other websites. Nevertheless, I want to talk about my number two biggest regret speaker. My Electric Blue Zoo Omen Def Mark IIs with Radiant Tweeter upgrades. Now, there has to be a special caveat. When I bought those speakers used... They didn't have the bass plinths. They were in their bass form with the original Eminence tweeter. So I upgraded them as I could afford to upgrade them. When I could, I put the bass plinths on. They already came with those awesome Speak On balanced um, connectors. So I had the the Zoo, I had the Zoo Mission cables to go with them. And then I was able to add the $750 Radian compression tweeters. Those are three inch compression tweeters. That's a 16 pound tweeter, folks. And then I took it a step further and I added Jupiter caps. So the way that the Zoo Omen Defs 
run is that you have one cap and you have one resistor. I bought the Mills, a Mills resistor. So I put a Mills resistor and a Jupiter cap on that tweeter. Those two 10.3 inch drivers run full range and, and you know lose steam after 10K. That is a, I believe a 100 dB per one watt efficient speaker. That is playing in an entirely different sandbox in the audiophile world, folks. What you don't understand is that those speakers could blow your socks off with a 5-watt amplifier. A lot of people don't understand that. When you have that level of efficiency, the whole world of amplification, amplification is opened up to you at that point. And I could go down so many rabbit holes with why the Zoo speakers are so special. And I'm talking about a magnitude order more special than the Dirty Weekends that I had. Having those two tens with that Radian driver, I have to say it a different way so that you kind of understand what's involved if you try to purchase them the way that I had them today from Zoo. It would cost you $8,000 now in 2023 to buy them how I had them set up. So, you know, I want there to be fair notice that, you know, to even talk about those speakers now against something like a $4,600 Harbeth, it's, it's, it's not even fair. It's not even a fair fight for either of these speakers. Why I loved my Zoo Omen Defs and why you see me constantly talking about them. I constantly bring them up. You should, you'll see that I'll sprinkle pictures throughout so many of my videos is those are the anti-audiophile speakers. Let me say that again. Zoo Audio, Zoo speakers are anti-audiophile speakers. What do I mean? Because folks who want Wilson's, folks who want Focal, folks who want hyper details, they want to hear the spit flying through the air as it travels down and hits the floor. That's not what a zoo speaker is. Folks that want to be able to get up and walk around the room and go, ooh, you know, this basis is right here and the flutist is over here, etc., etc., etc. That is not what the zoo speakers are good for. Those speakers are for folks who love live music. I've been to so many shows, and if you like small shows, if you like the clubs, if you like, you know, modest size venues, I've stood in front of the maestro, Buckethead, in Sacramento, and let me tell you, I could go home, and I could crank those Omen Defs up, and it was as close to the real thing as any speaker that I've ever had. You know, the other thing you don't understand about Zoo Omen, Omen speakers, or I should say about Zoos in general, that eminence driver, that 10 and a half inch driver, not only is that a highly modified, you know, not only is that a highly modified driver, but that's the kind of driver that actually goes into a lot of guitar amps. So you want a speaker that's going to replicate the hell out of an electric guitar or an acoustic guitar? You're hearing the closest thing to a live venue as you are in your room. That's, you know, something special about those speakers. The high efficiency, the no network on the driver, it's wide open, it's full range, and, <clears throat> you know, when playing Rodrigo e Gabriella, and I saw and I saw them in Cupertino. Gab Gabriella, she has a very special rhythmic way of playing her guitar, where where she strums and slaps the body of her guitar to make it sound like a drum. And the immediacy, the impact level, the sheer dynamics of those two tens, and and the radiating pattern. That's what it's like to replicate a live venue. Because when you're there, it's the atmosphere. It's those huge amps playing at you from stage. And when you have those two tens playing full range with a 100 
100 dB of efficiency, ultra fast dynamics that just, it hits you and you feel like you're there for the live event. And so what really stands out to me is being able to sit in my room and be able to play live albums, you know, to play Fleetwood Mac dance and to hear Mick Fleetwood hitting the drum drum kit and, you know, just the pitch of hitting that stupid cowbell <laughs> and the tone and the body of the cowbell, there's a realism there that those speakers replicate that audiophile speakers do not replicate. And that's what makes them so damn special. But I digress. I, you know, like I said, I just, I get really passionate about the Zoo Audio speakers and how I just, it, 12 years of this and the comments that I hear and people that are so judgmental about those, I already know that they've never owned them, they've never purchased them, they've never properly set them up in their own room with the way that those speakers get dismissed. So it's either you love hearing your gear and you listen to your music to listen to your gear, or you buy speakers like that because you really enjoy music and you really enjoy the hell out of live music. I have not owned, and, and, and you know, I have to be careful when I say this because I've had Altic Lansing voice of the theater. That's a whole different animal. So that's about, you know, talk about live event, a live event sounding speaker. That probably does take the cake. But, you know, for those of us who have spouses and significant others, the zoo omen deafs for me. I so miss that speaker. I really do miss that speaker. And at some point, I hope I can buy the definition. But at the way inflation is, that's probably never going to happen. Nevertheless, my number one speaker, the number one speaker that I will say I don't repeat speakers. I don't repeat ownership. And I'm just really weird about that. But... Many times I've almost pulled the trigger on buying another set of Totem Acoustic Fires. What Vince have, had, has done with the Element series of Totem is, again, it's a piece of art. And, you know, when I look back, I have to say this, when I look back across those 50 speakers that I've owned and I mention the Acoustic Research LS, that's a complicated five-way design. Then you got the JBLs. That's a complicated four-way design. I don't think it's an accident subconsciously in my head. When I think about my favorite speakers, they exponentially get simpler in their design. They exponentially get closer to being a full-range speaker. And that's, you know, my top two speakers, the Zoo with one cap, one resistor, well, guess what? It's kind of a weird coincidence that my number one speaker being the Totem Element Fires, you have a full range driver. That torrent driver that, that Vince built is a work of art. If, if you could buy that off the shelf and just put that anywhere in your room, I think it's worth looking at. The, what he did there is just, it's an, it's an incredibly expensive driver, and I understand why those speakers cost so much, but it's a special driver. It operates with no network, so it's a full-range operating driver, and he has a first-order network on only the tweeter. So when you're kind of looking at the Totem Element Fires, it's an unassuming, you know, it's a classy-looking, unassuming stand-mount speaker. It doesn't look like much. You know, it doesn't have parallel walls. You know, it's slanted back and it's got different, you know, it has a different design to it to deal, to deal with the, you know, the standing waves in the cabinet and to eliminate those. But it is a solid, well-built stand mount speaker. They're 32 pounds a piece. And again, a lot of the weight is that torrent driver. How, you know, Synergy is key. And let me say this. The best synergy I had with that speaker, I had Mark Levinson number 331 112-pound amplifier. When I connected that Mark Levinson 
with that totem element fire in my big room at the time in Northern California, all the audiophile cliches came into view. Everything I had read from Stereophile, everything I had read from Absolute Sound, from Home Theater Magazine, on and on and on and on and on. All of those cliches made perfect sense when I heard that combination. Those two, those totems, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out, a, you know, the trope, the holography, the holographic soundstage with that amplifier, with that amplifier, with those speakers, the cliche that I had mentioned earlier, I felt that I could get up out of my chair and walk around this guitarist, that bassist, Stevie Nicks, Mick Fleetwood back there on the drum kit, 10 feet, mind you. It was like, I just never, I've never experienced that with all the 50 speakers that I've owned with what those totems did. As much as I like the Harbeth Super 5s, those totems beat the Super 5s when it came to a holographic soundstage. Just absolutely the best I've ever heard. Another thing that was the most bizarre to me at the time, and this was a, that, that particular time in my audio journey was still pretty early, I have to say this, I'm going to show these pictures. While those speakers are standing in my front room, I have in the garage, I'm reconditioning a set of 1981 uh, Clips La Scala's, completely sand them down and refinish them and rebuilt them. I had those A7s in the, in the garage. I had a pair of ADS L1230s that I was waiting on new woofers for. I had some humongous speakers in that garage. And I'm telling you, those totems did things that none of those speakers could do. And here was the other strange thing. I was playing Buckethead. I was playing Soothsayer, Soothsayer dedicated to Aunt Susie. And while I'm listening to that, when I'm listening to Buckethead shredding, and I'm watching the torrent driver just, the speed and the articulation of it, I had to tell Amanda, I've never heard, I've never heard my music sound so fast. It sounded like somehow I actually hit, I hit the speed dial on my amplifiers because for some reason everything, everything sounded a little quicker, a little bit more of a pace, a little bit more of an uptick. And I'm going, is this what the British call Pratt? Because pr Pratt for days with those totem element fires. It did bass so fast. It did articulation. It did pitch. You know, the timbre with instruments, listening to classical instruments, listening to the separation of the cellos. You know, you talk about the big speakers, you talk about the ARs and all those drivers. Guess what? Those drivers couldn't separate the cello section and the individual chairs. And then you have the violin section with the individual chairs. The totems would separate and you would hear the, you would hear individual players within the orchestra and you know without you know without the hyper realism of of a of a speaker that that gives you fatigue that was the, you know the other thing all these speakers on my list no fatigue factor the totem acoustic element fires was like nigel turning the volume up to 11 if you flip everything on their head and you say, okay, well, what do they do wrong? What, you know, let's, they do all the stuff that's right. Here's a whole list of everything that they do right. What did they do wrong? They weren't big enough to play sub 30 hertz bass? Well, I had two subwoofers in the room at that time, so not an issue. But yes, you know, I don't like subwoofers. I haven't had subwoofers in a very long time. Okay, they don't play sub 30 hertz bass. These don't even come close, and I love these speakers. So that's really not that big of an issue. For most of you, you would buy a REL. What else? 
I don't know, folks. I mean, you know, yes, the memory is, you know, the memory, the memory tends to focus on more of the good and not the bad, but there are so many bad speakers that I owned, I could go on for days about bad speakers. But when I think about those totem element fires, I cannot come up with something that they did that was bad. I really, I can't. I'm stuck. I'm stuck to find what those speakers could not do or something I wish it had a little bit more of. More full range? Well, the driver was full range. So again, it only comes down to they couldn't play the, 20, the 28 hertz key on grand piano. Okay, well, some things you do have to give up at certain price points. Well, then there's the Philharmonic BMR floor stander, right? I haven't had one yet. Maybe that's the speaker to own. I don't know. This is about my regret speakers and ones I wish I, I still had with me. But you could see where my mind goes when I think about it. 20 minutes later. The Torrent driver and the SB Acoustics ceramic driver in the BMR. Of the 50 speakers I've owned, those two, as I said in the review, in my review of the BMRs, they're as close as they get. One's a $7,500 speaker today, one's a $2,000 speaker. How would they fare with the top electronics in this smaller room? I don't know. I don't know, I'm being honest. I love them both. I wish I still had them to pit side by side, but I can't sit on $10,000 worth of speakers and still do reviews for you guys. So if I'm being honest to a fault here, that's, you know, that's where, that's where my head is at. Totem Acoustic Element Fire, Zoo Omen Def Mark IIs with the Radian Tweeters, $7,500, $8,000, $2,000 BMRs. They're not in my room. The zoos probably wouldn't work in this room. I'm going to guarantee the zoos wouldn't work in this room with the two 10-inch drivers. That's, that was just too big of a speaker for this small of a room. The, the, the baby grands are as big as, they, as I can get away with in this room. That's just a fact. Rooms matter. Room size matters. Room treatments matter. It's a fact. But in my journey, I'm looking at the next speaker. I don't like do-overs. And that's where I'm a little weird. I don't want to go back to something. I'd rather look forward and move to the next thing. There's going to be something else out there that I'm going to enjoy and I want to experience it. And I'm just going to keep moving forward to the next speakers. Maybe there's a V2 in my future. I don't know. Nevertheless, I appreciate you all tuning in. I'll list this out. I'll do the strengths to recap, because I, I know I was all over the board, but I'm two channel listening. I'm all over the board. Love me or hate me, just like, just like my zoos. I am what you get. <laughs> I wish you all have a wonderful week. Play your music, enjoy your music, music first, then the gear. Let us do the reviewing for you and kind of help you figure out what you might like. Until next time, yes, the baby grand will be next. Have a great week, everybody.